Sharing procrastination. Woo, amen. But before I talk about the power of now, let's talk about five years. What does your life look like in five years? Five years from now. The next five years of your life can be the most exciting, the most successful time of your life, or they can be absolutely boring, meaningless, stay the same, just the same old, same old. But what is five years? Look, I, nobody has these anymore in little. I saw them one time. I should have bought them a long time ago. Who wants some candy? Woo! Take five. Come on, run down here. There's three of them in here, so you can share with your neighbor. Take five. Here, there's one, one for y'all. Take five. I was going to give everybody a take five. Anybody on this side want some? Ooh, wait, I got some more. You got to share with your neighbor. Here you go. All right, there. All right. I owe you one. I'll get some more before next week. I'll bring in some take five. <laughs> take five. But I wanted to get one of those for everybody. What does five years look like? It's 260 weeks, 1,825 days, 2,333,000 minutes approximately. And you know, most, most people in the, in the world say you should have a five-year plan, right? Call it, you go to college, they want you to have, sometimes it's a five-year plan. But let me tell you, here's a few things that happened to some remarkable people in five years. Christopher Columbus, in less than five years, discovered the Bahamas, Cuba, Hispaniola, and North and South America. Michelangelo painted the Sistine Chapel. I'm sure you've seen the Sistine Chapel, at least pictures of it. I'm going to go there someday. Shakespeare wrote Hamlet, Othello, King Lear, Macbeth, and five other immortal plays. All in less than five years, or right at five years. So my question to you tonight is, what are you going to do with the next five years of your life? What are you going to do? Think about it. I was consulting with a great doctor. <laughs> a great doctor. He writes really good books. His name is Dr. Seuss. And this book is called, Oh, the Places You'll Go. I'm going to read the first page to you. Maybe you've heard it, but I'm going to read it to you. And just listen, because he has a way with words. You have brains in your head. You have feet in your shoes. You can steer yourself any direction you choose. You're on your own, and you know what you know. And you are the guy who'll decide where to go. You. Or the guy, or the gal, we could put in there, who will decide where to go. You have the power <laughs> of where you're going to go. Napoleon Hill says this, I can teach anyone how to get what they want in life. The problem is I can't find anybody who knows what they want. Ooh. <laughs> we can teach you what to get in life, but we can't find anybody that knows what they want. You will do what you want to do. And you know what? You're never going to leave where you're at until you see where you're going. You're never going to leave where you're at until you see where you're going. So back to five years <laughs> from now. How old are you? Think about it. You might even want to write it down. What year is it? How old are your kids? Do you have kids? How long have you been married? Are you married? Are you getting married? Engage are you getting engaged in the next five years? What does that look like? If nothing, ha, 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 ha. Oh, just kidding. <laughs> A little snicker from over here. If nothing changes, are you content with that? Are you satisfied? Are you frustrated? If nothing changes in five years, how will you feel? Maybe some of us feel like we've missed opportunities or wasted some years of our life. Well, let me tell you about a guy named Dean Rhodes. Just a little, little short story here. Dean Rhodes met a guy named Dave. And when he met Dave, he had an opportunity to invest in this gentleman, Dave, in the infant stage of his restaurant business, which is now known, and this Dave was Dave Thomas. Well, Dean Rhodes didn't invest, and now we have Wendy's, right? He, he turned that down. Well, a little while later, he... <coughs> met an older gentleman, and this older gentleman tried to convince him to invest in stock on the ground floor before it went public, and he turned the colonel down, Colonel Sanders in Kentucky Fried Chicken. 
Man, you're like, okay, I would have already done build. Well, he was in the equipment business, restaurant equipment business, and he met a guy named Ray. And Ray tried to get him to invest in his company as well from the ground up, this little hamburger stand he called McDonald's. And he didn't do it. <laughs> he passed it up. Then he went on a cruise. And he met an attorney on the cruise. And while he was on the cruise, the attorney said, man, you got to invest in my son's computer business. Had a funny name called Microsoft. He passed it up. Man, okay, we got Wendy's. We got McDonald's. We got Kentucky Fried Chicken, Microsoft. And what was the other one? Uh, McDonald's. Passed them all up. And so maybe he read Micah 7, 8. <laughs> when I fail, when I fall, I shall rise. Because he kept, he kept failing, kept failing. But you know what? Dean Rhodes never gave up. And he found himself number 289 on the Forbes list of the most successful businessmen. I mean, there's 500 usually on that Forbes list. He was 289, so that's not too bad. He was still on there. He still made it. It was not too late. You see, don't look at the years you've lost, but look at the years you have ahead of you. Our great president, Theodore Roosevelt, said, He who makes no mistakes makes no progress. He who makes no mistakes makes no progress. So I'm going to ask you, what actions this year are you going to take that are different from last year? We're already a month in. It's the 3rd of February. Have you changed anything? Have you changed anything in your year? You know, my husband was speaking on seven. Um, he did an awesome job teaching you all three weeks on seven s successful steps. <laughs> I can't even say it right. Seven, se seven steps to success. Say that ten times real fast. <laughs> seven steps to success. And he did an outstanding job. But he could stand up here and teach that stuff to his blue in the face. But if you don't apply it to your life, nothing's going to change. <laughs> We've got to start, and we've got to start now. We've got to start now. So what do you see in, those, in the next five years? What are you doing to prepare and plan for that? Are you planning? The truth is, and I'm, I've got scriptures coming, I promise. Often we just get too busy. We just get too busy with this thing we call life. At least we like to say we're busy. But really we just need to sit down and dream and write it down, right? We don't take the time. We just don't take the time. It's our own fault. We don't sit down and take time. So, like I said, a lot can happen in five years or absolutely nothing at all. So i got two questions tonight. Number one, what do you see yourself doing? And this, I was telling you, my husband is at A&M sharing our charity, Treasures of the Amazon River. And this has um, bracelets in it that are made by the women that live in the village of Chimbo. But let me just tell you a little bit of backstory. Because we went to um, the Amazon Brazil this summer, and um, I love foreign missions. I am, have a huge missions heart, and my husband, I could never get him to go. <laughs> I was like, come on, and he was like, oh yeah, we're gonna go on the rain, Amazon rainforest, we're gonna be on the in the jungle, yeah, I'm all for it, babe. He's thinking, you can go to mission work while I have a vacation. <laughs> That's, that's his idea. And I'm like, okay, well, whatever, as long as you go with me. But he came, and it changed his life. When we got to the village of Chimbo, we worked in the city of Manaus, the capital there, for a few days. And that really wasn't his cup of tea. But we worked and we served. And I like all aspects of it. <laughs> but when we got on the boat, and we took a 12-hour boat ride up to this little village called Chimbo, and we got off the boat, the kids, he was playing, he was at the front of the boat, the kids were waiting at the dock, and it was dark, and he was doing all these games, and you know, Captain Rex and kids, Captain Rex, the kids love him, he's really good with kids, well, and adults do too, but he was doing all this stuff, and so the next day we got off the boat, we just worked in the village, and that night we went to church, and he was looking around, and I was looking at him, and I was like, what is he looking at, and he goes, do you see that, and I was like, do I see what? <laughs> Well, the whole village had come, and there was lots of little kids, like a hundred little kids, and then there was lots of teenage boys and two teenage girls. Two teenage girls. And there, the parents were there as well. But there was only two teenage girls. And he was like, why is there only two teenage girls here? Well, the parents sell their children for money into slavery. The slave boats 
run rampant up and down the Amazon River. So these boats of men will just pull up, and these parents will sell their daughters. From six, I mean, as young as six has been sold, there was still a lot of six-year-olds there. But we knew at that moment that if something wasn't done, and we come back the next time, out of those hundred little kids, those little girls would be gone. And it's not... It's not that they want to sell their kids, because they don't. No parent wants to sell their kids, but they, didn't, they don't have a means of anything to bring income into their family. They just didn't, they don't know what to do. They don't have the life skills. They don't have all of this stuff. So we were like, what are we going to do? And we have missionary liaisons there. So my husband was like, we got to do something. So we started going around. The next day, we went and we tried to buy anything we could buy just to get money in these people's hands from them. So we bought like some oars and then everybody on the trip was buying these oars because they have these wood boats. Well, that guy, when we, when we um, sold him that oar, the guy went and bought a chicken for his mom. Now this village is in the middle of the, rain, the rainforest. It's like two hours by boat to the next nearest village that's, or city, I should say, so to speak. There's villages all up and down. But they don't know any better. So what I'm saying is we saw a problem. We got it in our heads, and I'm telling you, as soon as we started, we bought those things, and then it was, we weren't in the village very long. We were only there like three days, and we pulled out, and we were like, we're going to do something. When we get home, we're going to start something. We started it while we were there, but we we're going to finish it when we get home. As soon as we got home, I filed all the necessary paperwork. We were like, how are we going to do this? And we are a fully legit 501A2 <laughs> Charity. We, didn't, we went non-religious as far as the treasures of the Amazon is concerned because we can get grants and things like that to help. But we had to see it, right? We saw the problem. We saw the need. And we were like, we need to do something about it. But we didn't wait. We waited. I mean, we had to wait till we got back home. But as soon as we got home, I filed all the paperwork. I had my 501c3 clearance from the IRS within two weeks, and it was over the Thanksgiving holiday. <laughs> We had it fully established, all the necessary paperwork filed with the state and everything. But if you don't see it, if you see yourself doing nothing, you will do absolutely nothing. But we saw the lives that would be changed. So now we sell these bracelets. I'll just finish a little bit off of what I was talking. Now we sell these bracelets. We send all the funds back to the village. It goes to the ladies. They, um, we paid for the bracelets up front. Now the, all the money goes back to them. We don't keep any of the profits. That's not what we're about. It's all going back to them so they can support their families and they won't ever have to sell their children again. And also we're helping with the plantation. There's a plantation there. We're going to pay the husbands to work the plantation. There's just lots of things that are going to happen. When we get done in this village, we're going to go to the next one. And we're just going to keep going. <laughs> So you're in, we're, our first trip is in September. So in September, if you want to go to Brazil, hit us up. We'll let you know because we are going in Brazil, going back to see them. But if you see yourself doing nothing, you will do nothing. You see, the truth is that right here in, our, in the Bible, and um, my husband talked a lot about vision, and, and um, it's, this is really kind of tagging on to that. Habakkuk 2.2, it tells us exactly what to do. He says... Um, well, I had, oh, I just unmarked my Bible. <laughs> Not good. I just ripped that right out. Habakkuk 2.2 tells us, write the vision and make it plain, right? Mom, put it on tablets, set it in before you so you can, so the runners can see it. I got to, totally unmarked it. So if we're honest with ourselves, we got to sit down, we got to sit, we got to think, and we got to dream. And the biggest thing, the biggest question stopping your dreaming is how. Because we're, we're human in the, in the natural, in the flesh. We're like, well, how are we going to do that? How are we going to conquer human trafficking on the Amazon River? Well, we're going to do what we know how, what we need to do, and God's going to come in and do the rest. But we're going to do the necessary steps that we need to do. And he, us working with him, because we're co-laborers, are going to get it done. Amen? You have to see yourself something before you can do it. And I keep saying that. We see in pictures. You've got to have a clear picture. He saw, my, my husband saw that night in that chapel was two teenage girls out of the hundreds of people that were there. That's what stood out to him the most, was just the two teenage girls, which birthed this charity, this foundation that we've started. 
And he saw it in the pictures. And he told you, like on his phone, he showed you the pictures of, of his goals, our goals. There, I have a vision board sitting next to my desk. It's real big. It says vision on it. And I have pictures. I have goals. Our goals are listed on there. I have a picture of the United States, and I have a picture of Brazil, and I've got the boat. The same pictures that are scrolling on his phone are on my board. I see them every day. Got to get it in front of you. Dodi Osteen wrote a book called Healed of Cancer. This is Joel Osteen's mom. But every time she got up, her, her struggle was real. She didn't just write a book just to write it. She really had cancer. And so every morning she would get up and look in the mirror, and all she could see was death. And if you know anybody that's been sick or has been diagnosed with something terminal, that's what they, I mean, it's just, it's kind of natural for them to see that. They see death. But she knew that she had to change what she saw in order to get healed. So she went through all of her family photo albums, and she got every picture of herself whole and healthy, stuck them to her bathroom mirror, so that every time she got up in the morning, she would see herself healed and whole. She would stick them around the house. And so she would see life and not death. You see, um, when my mom got diagnosed with cancer and she lost all her hair, she had to get wigs. She wasn't going to walk around bald-headed. She got the wigs. She had to have a mastectomy. She got reconstructive surgery. Why? Because she had to see herself beautiful. Every time she looked in the mirror, it's hard for a, a woman, I'd say this to the women, to look in the mirror and see stuff gone. <laughs> It probably would be for a male, just the same thing, for a man to stand in front of the mirror and see things gone. It, it plays on your emotions, but you've got to see yourself the way you want it to be. She had to see herself healed. She had to see herself alive and healthy. We have to surround ourselves with what can be, not what is. That is so important. I talked about the power of your words the power of I am, um, that Sunday that I was here. But the, and this is another thing, you're in your confession, you got to get it out there, but you got to see it. you got to see it too. Seeing it's really important. We talked about um, when we wanted to get debt free, we wrote it on our mirror in our bathroom. So every morning when we got up, it was right there, we could see it debt free. So everything we did from then on out, if it wasn't making us debt free, then we didn't do it. We didn't go out and buy a bag of chips and go down to the short stop and get a 40 ounce drink or whatever because that stuff adds up <laughs> it adds up and that's not helping you get that free see vision takes you from where you are to where you, you want to be that vision is so important I got another little story for you anybody know who Howard Schultz is anybody Starbucks <laughs> everybody knows what Starbucks is right I had Starbucks. I had my weekly Starbucks on the way down here. <laughs> on Wednesdays, I stop because there's one in Seguin, so we stop. But Starbucks used to be a whole bean company. Did anybody know that? Just whole bean. That's all they sold was whole bean coffee. So it was just another um, whole bean coffee. Well, Howard Schultz used to sell the coffee makers to um, Starbucks so they could make coffee, just regular coffee, but for the whole bean. So Howard got Starbucks to hire him. Well, when Howard started working for him, he decided he would go on a trip to Italy. And so when he was in Italy, he had saved up his money, and he had a vision. <laughs> when he was there, there was these people lined up for miles down the road in front of all these coffee shops in Italy. And he's like, these people are lined up for coffee? <laughs> Why are they lined up for coffee? And so he realized that they were there for a relationship, you know, they were meeting people. It was a social thing and all this stuff. But they, if they could work over there, why couldn't it work back in America? So when Howard came back from his vacation, he went to the Starbucks CEOs and he was like, hey, you know, we need to, uh, we need to um, start doing this and making this coffee and open it up. Well, they weren't in any bit interested. So he quit and he left and he opened his own coffee shop. And I will say just within a few years, I think it was three years, he bought Starbucks and took it over. <laughs> because he saw what could be. He saw, then look at Starbucks now, they're everywhere. There's like 200,000 plus stores and it is a place to go and be social and hang out and, and have good coffee. I think their coffee is great. I know some people don't like their coffee, but I like their coffee. It's good. I don't just drink coffee though, I like mochas and... I like the fancy stuff. <laughs> so, but he saw what could be, not what was. 
when he got when he was in Italy, he saw he saw the success, and the and he couldn't get the CEOs or anybody to think like he was thinking. But he had already seen it, so he put it into practice. I mean, he opened his own shop. He bought Starbucks for three point eight million dollars, whatever years ago that was. And I can't even imagine what he's worth now. I didn't look it up. But successful people visualize their dream. Successful people visualize their dream. Number two. And this is probably the biggest thing. When are you going to do it? You got to conquer procrastination. We have to learn to conquer procrastination. This is probably the biggest point. Psalms 90 verse 12 tells us to no teach us to number our days. I'm going to read it right out of my book. 90 verse 12 right out of the Bible. Teach us to realize the brevity of life so that we may grow in wisdom. The King James Version says, so teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Um, um, apparently it's important for us to number our days. We get this tomorrow mentality. Oh, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. Remember we talked about making the bed every day? <laughs> We got to make our bed every day, and that's something that we just had to start doing. We had to get up and make our bed no matter who was coming over, not put it off till tomorrow. Or um, 2 Corinthians 6 2 says, Indeed, the right time is now. Today is the day. It's talking about salvation in, the, in that, that thing, but right, indeed, the right time is now. We don't need to be putting off to tomorrow what we can do today. We've got to get serious about today. Another thing people like to say is someday. Oh, someday I'm going to grow up and I'm going to get a job. Or someday I'm going to finish my education. Or someday I'm going to go buy a new truck. Or someday. Someday is not a day of the week. <laughs> someday is not a day of the week. Today matters. The definition of procrastination is the act of putting off. Whether it be an it can be an intentional thing, it can be an accidental thing, but I, it, more than likely it's intentional. But the act of putting off, putting it off, just keep you keep putting it off. If you don't do something within 24 hours, you probably aren't going to do anything. When we got this vision at the church that night, we wrote it down. And we started. That was the start. We got it written down. So in the next 24 hours, you need to get one of your dreams written down on paper. I'm talking to everybody in here. Whatever it is. Maybe you want to open a coffee shop. Maybe you want to open a homeless shelter. Maybe you want to do a soup kitchen. Maybe you want to um, do some sort of outreach. Maybe you want to have your own business. Maybe you want to be a doctor or a lawyer. Maybe you want to finish go back and get your education. Maybe you didn't finish getting your education. Whatever it is. Maybe you want to be debt free. <laughs> if you want to be debt free, then go home and add up all your debt. You might cry. Okay? Go home and add up all your debt, but write it down. That's starting. That's somewhere. You've got to know what you're trying to get out of. Most people don't even know what they're trying to get out of with debt. <laughs> they don't know all their debt. But go home. Add it all up. Get that figure and say, okay, this is what I'm doing. I'm going to start tonight, right? And then you just go. And if it does not go to get that debt down, then, it sh then you, gotta, you can't do it. You can't do it. You can't go buy that Coke. Maybe you can't go buy that pack of cigarettes or whatever it is, maybe, because some of us probably still have habits. But you know what I mean? If it's not helping you, then maybe you should let it go. <laughs> Give it to God. Give it to God. In March of 1975, anybody in here old enough to remember March of 1975? I'm not. <laughs> no, but this, is, whoop, but this is good. This is good. March of 1975. Joe raised his hand, and Joe will probably remember this. Webner, a 30 to 1 underdog. Come on, boxing was big when I was a kid. When I was growing up, boxing, Webner. He was going up against the great Muhammad Ali. Okay? He was in the, best, with, in the ring with the best of the best. Right? He was a 30 to 1 underdog. In the ninth round, Webner knocked down Ali. Knocked him to the ground. Like, nobody's, I don't think, before that had ever knocked Ali down. And was within seconds of defeating Muhammad Ali. Everybody know who Muhammad Ali is? If you don't, you might want to look him up. It's really hard for me to watch him now because I used to watch him when he was full in his prime. And boxing was amazing. Boxing blew UFC out of the water when I was growing up. But now it's UFC, UFC, UFC. Nothing like that. Anyways, he was within seconds. But in the 
15, or Ali got back up, and in the 15th round, Ali won and kept his title. But a thousand miles away, a thousand miles away, a down and out actor, writer and director by the name of Sylvester Stallone was watching the fight on TV. And all he could think about is get me a pencil. Get me a pencil. Get me a pencil. And for the next three days, he wrote one of the greatest movies of all time, Rocky. Because he couldn't figure out until he saw that, until he visualized it. He was trying to figure out how to write a movie about a, a boxer. But until he saw that, he didn't get it. But when he, got, when he saw that and he got the pencil, he wrote it down. And he wrote for three days. And Rocky won three Oscars and the Best Picture. But what if Sylvester Stallone would have said, oh, I'll wait till tomorrow. <laughs> One, he probably wouldn't remember. I mean, it would have been exciting, but usually um, statistics show that you forget stuff after you watch it. Within the first 24 hours, you only remember like 50%, and then it just drops off from there. But what if he would have said, I'll wait till tomorrow? We wouldn't, we wouldn't have had Rocky, because ins the inspiration may not be there tomorrow. God's probably talking to you right now as I'm up here talking about some dreams that you have on the inside of you. Maybe, I don't even know, car detailing. I know some of the guys in here do like window tinting and those kind of things. Maybe, and God's just dealing with you about stuff, about dreams. Dream again. You're not too old to have dreams. And you're not too young to have dreams either. The power of now. You got to do it now. Let's look at the Bible and a story about procrastination. Go with me to John uh, chapter 5. We got to have dreams. Dreams are important. We got to get them on paper. And we got to prepare. John 5. All right, I'm going to read this to you. John 5, 1 through 9. Afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days. Inside the city near the Sheep Gate was the Pool of Bethesda with five covered porches. Crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on the porches. One of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. When Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, Would you like to get well? And he, his reply was, I can't, sir, the sick man said, for I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. Jesus told him, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. Okay, let's go back to verse 6. When Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, would you like to get well? Why do you think Jesus had to ask him? Jesus had to ask him, would you like to get well? Why? To see if he had faith? Not just to see if he had faith, but nothing had changed in 38 years. Nothing had changed. The guy was still laying there right next to the pool. Nothing had changed. And then did you see what he said? I can't, sir. For I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. Woe is me. The self-pity. His answer is in self-pity. No one would help me. No one would help me. But Jesus told him, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. Hallelujah. He did. He said, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. Are you sure that you want to preach? Are you sure that you want to go to college? Are you sure that you want to get married? Are you sure that um, whatever dream is in your heart, that are you sure you want to do it? Are you sure you want to go on a mission trip? Are you sure you want to, um, you want to be a millionaire? Then get up, take up your mat, and walk. Start doing it. Nobody can do it for you. You've got to do it yourself. Quit talking about it. Quit waiting for someone to come alongside and say, oh, come on, let me take your hand. We're going to go this way. You've got to do it. You've got to do it. Yes, there will be people that will come, probably come along and try to help you. There's also going to be people that are going to come and try to steal your dream from you. Beware of the dream snatchers. But come on, you've got to get up and do it. And you've got to do it now. <laughs> you've got to get it on paper. You've got to get up. I mentioned this story in, when I talked about the power of your words, but you remember the Israelites in Numbers? 
It took them 40 years. 40 years they wandered in that wilderness for what should have took 11 days. 40 years. And you know why? I told you why. Their mouth. They complained. Their mouth was their biggest problem. And when you complain, you will stay in the same mess and in the same place year after year after year. Ooh. I hope I'm encouraging you tonight. <laughs> We've got to do it now. Complaining is going to keep you right where you are. We've got to stop. We've got to stop complaining. We've got to stop complaining and start making progress. Stop complaining and start making progress. You know, when you take that step of obedience, God always rewards it. He always rewards obedience. Always. Just do it. Here's a word of advice. God will never advance you past your last act of disobedience. God will never advance you past your last act of disobedience. So if you're stuck back here, maybe you're already trying to get somewhere and you've been and you're stuck, maybe you need to say, hey, Lord, is there somewhere in my walk in my life that I've been disobedient? Can you bring it back to my remembrance? And then when he shows it to you, <laughs> guess what you got to do? <laughs> you got to go back and fix it. You got to obey him. So um, I know there's a few kids in here. If your parents asked you to make your bed <laughs> and told you to make your bed in the morning and you didn't make your bed in the morning, guess what? You need to go back and make your bed. <laughs> and then you need, to, you need to do it. If there's somebody in your life that he said, you need to forgive that person, ooh, I know, that, that's one of the hardest ones. They hurt you, they hurt your kids, they hurt your spouse, they hurt one of your family members, whatever. But if the Lord has told you that you need to forgive them, and he has, because his word tells us we have to forgive, it doesn't have to be like, hey, you. I mean, it already is here. It's written. <laughs> we have to forgive them. So if we're bearing that unforgiveness in our heart, then we're not being obedient, and God can't move us to our next level. And we want to go to the next level. We want to be successful. So God will not advance you past your last act of disobedience. And here's another good thing. Somebody in need is waiting on the other side of your obedience. Homeless shelter, soup kitchen, um, car wash, Mother's Day out, any of those kind I mean I'm just thinking uh, maybe someone needs help with their groceries maybe the Lord told you to pay for somebody's gas or the food behind you whatever somebody in need is waiting for you to say okay I'll do it I'll do it Lord I hear you they're waiting for you to be obedient Job 14 5 let's go to Job 14 5 Ooh. is this good I hope so I hope so. Job 14.5, you have decided the length of our lives. You know how many months we will live, and we are not given a minute longer. He knows. He knows how long we're here. And you know as well as I know that it can be taken... Your life can end just in an instant, just like that. And I'm sure you've had people, you've known people, um, friends, family members, whatever, that have just, I mean, maybe you thought it was too soon, what have you, what not. But I'm telling you, he knows how many months, he knows how many days, he knows how many hours we're going to be here, and we're not given a minute longer, so we've got to do it now. <laughs> we can't put it off till tomorrow. Today matters. Right now matters. It matters that you're here tonight because he's encouraging you to get it on paper and get moving because you've got to do it now. You've got to be prepared. We've got to conquer procrastination. The way you do anything, you will do everything. The way you do anything, you will do everything. If you wake up late every morning, <laughs> if you get to work too late all the time, you get to school late, you pay your bills late, all those kinds of things, you return things late... And you get embarrassed because you're late. Remember, that was one of our ties, timeliness. If you're early, you're on time. If you're on time, you're late. And if you're late, you're fired. <laughs> it's a good core value to have. <laughs> but if you procrastinate in the little things, it will trickle over into the big things. If you procrastinate in the little things, like your alarm, 
not going off. I mean, there's professional football players that can't get up when their alarm goes off, so they get fired from their job, which I'm thankful that their coach fired them because I hope they learned their lesson. They're a grown adult. You should be able to get up when your alarm goes off. <laughs> right? But if you procrastinate in the small things, it's going to trickle over into the big things. So we've got to conquer that procrastination. I got another, another Bible story. I'm going to read it out of... Where did I put my phone? I'm going to read it out of the message version. I didn't bring my message Bible, but I got my message version on my, uh, my, my other, my virtual Bible. <laughs> All right, Proverbs 6, and it's in the normal Bible. I just like the way it reads. Proverbs 6, 6 through 11. You lazy fool, look at an ant. Watch it closely and let it teach you a thing or two. I actually watched the ants while I was in the Amazon. They were the biggest things I had ever seen in my life. Their heads were like huge. I took pictures. Interesting to watch the ants. Watch it closely. Let it teach you a thing or two. Nobody has to tell it what to do. All summer it stores up food. At harvest it stockpiles provisions. So how long are you going to laze around doing nothing? How long before you get out of bed... A nap here, a nap there, a day off here, a day off there. Sit back, take it easy. Do you know what comes next? Just this. You can look forward to a dirt poor life. Poverty, your permanent house guest. I didn't make that up. <laughs> That's actually in the Bible. It, it helps when we read it so we can learn some lessons. And that's from Proverbs. That's the book of wisdom right there. Proverbs, you can read that in 31 days in a, in a month. You can read a proverb a day and go back and start over, and you can learn some mighty, mighty things in there. But the ants, nobody has to tell it what to do. When we're little, yeah, our parents, you know, they teach us. They tell us what to do. But I'm looking around. Most of you are grown. <laughs> You're going to do what you want to do. But we got to learn from the ant. Nobody should have to tell us what to do. we got to stop procrastinating. So I'm going to challenge you not only to get one thing on the paper in the next 24 hours, that's super important, but list your top 10 things, top 10 things that you want to do, that you've been putting off, I should say. Maybe you've been putting it off. Designate specific days to work on them and start. Check them off one by one. And this is going to prepare you to go after the bigger dream God has for you. Right? Right? We've got to start somewhere. You've got to start planning. We've got to do it now. You will only go where and as far as you see yourself or as you want to go. So where do you see yourself? You've got to want to. You've got to want to. Who wants to? Who wants to be successful? Who wants to go and do what God has called them to do? Who? I mean, dream. You guys are too young not to be dreaming still. And letting God fulfill those dreams. Anybody seen a Chinese bamboo tree? <laughs> Do you know anything about a Chinese bamboo tree? I'm going to tell you a little bit about a Chinese bamboo tree. When you plant the seed in the first year, nothing happens above ground. You don't see anything. The second year, you'll look at it after you're watering or whatever, nothing. Still nothing. The third year, nothing. You're probably like, I would have given up by this point. I would have thought, man, I just killed that seed. <laughs> The fourth year, still nothing. I would have been like, what am I doing wrong? Fourth year, or fifth year, that bamboo will shoot up 80 feet. 80 feet up in the air, out of the ground, in that fifth year. And you know what it was doing that whole time before? It was preparing the roots. Its roots were growing out to be able to support that amount of growth in that amount of time. For it to grow 80 feet, that root system, it was preparing. We've got to invest time. That four years of was invested time in that bamboo for it to shoot out. Right now, you're investing time. You need to listen. You need to write. You need to prepare. You need to develop. You know, preparation time is never wasted. It's never wasted time. Because when the opportunity comes, it's too late to prepare. Right? When the opportunity, if the opportunity shows up, you can't be like, oh, wait, um, I need to go pack my bags. <laughs> they got to already be packed. We were, it was told to us a long time ago, never, get ready, never to unpack your bags. 
Hallelujah. We live in suitcases. <laughs> we do. And literally, my daughter's like moving her clothes from one suitcase to the next suitcases. Last night, I cleaned out my son's closet. There were seven suitcases in his closet. Seven suitcases in his closet. And almost all of them still had stuff in it. It's like, son, we've got to get organized. But you, got, you can't prepare when the opportunity comes. You've got to be prepared before the opportunity comes. You're preparing now for the rest of your life. I don't care how old you are in here. You're preparing now for the rest of your life. You, you're sitting here. You're breathing. You're still alive. You still have potential. And you still got a job to do. Right? You're still here. So you still got work to do. I still got work to do. There's a lost and dying world out there. And this is World Changers Church. Y'all got to get out there, win souls, and make disciples. And I do too. Because that's one of the things we do. But not just in here, not in these four walls. We got to get out there. We got to get out there. We are all called. We're all called to go. No matter what, all of us are called to go and share. So we got to conquer procrastination and do it now. Everybody say, do it now. Do it now. You got 24 hours. I should take all y'all's phone numbers and call you tomorrow at 7.55 and say, okay, what's your dream? You got it on paper? You got one dream. Just one of them. Get it on paper within the next 24 hours and start taking those steps. But I challenge you to get 10 things that you've been putting off. I love my husband, <laughs> but he is a Sanders, and he's a 95 percenter. He will get something 95 percent done, but that's why he married me. Because I'm the finisher. I'm the other five percenter. Some of you might not be completers. Some of you might need a finisher in your life. <laughs> Get somebody alongside of you that's going to help you finish. <laughs> going to help you finish. And, that, and that's something we, we got to look at ourselves. We got to evaluate ourselves and see where we are. See what kind, what kind of person we are. But um, we got to conquer procrastination and do it now. Be like the ants. Don't wait for somebody to tell you what to do. Because the truth of the matter is, I'm not gonna, I can't sit here and tell you what God wants you to do specifically for your life. You know what he wants you to do. Because you, you got it in, deep inside of you. And you got to do it. You got to do it. You got to do it. You got to want to. You can't see, where you, or you can't go. If you see nothing, you'll do nothing. So let's get it done. Let's get it up there. Let's do it now. Let's stop procrastinating. Amen. Amen. Bow your heads with me. Father, we just thank you. We thank you for the opportunity once again to hear your word and that we need to conquer procrastination. Father, each and every one of us need to do it now. You know the time we have here. Our days are numbered and no man knows when their time is up. But Father, you do and we want to be finishers of the race and we want to do everything you have called us to do and fulfill the dreams that you have placed inside of our heart to help us. Help us tonight as we leave here to get those dreams written on paper and to start going after them now. Help us to do it now. Not to worry about the how, but to do it now because you will fulfill the how. Father, I thank you for each and every person in here. I thank you for the dreams that are inside of them. I thank you for the calling, the purpose, the passion, everything that you have placed on each and every person in here. And I just ask that you will bless them abundantly beyond their heart's desire. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. We love you guys so much. It's going to be hard. It's going to be hard when, um, when you all get a new pastor, which I'll be so happy for you guys when you do, but it's going to be hard. We'll just have to come back and visit. We'll just have to be friends with them and come back and visit. <laughs> we'll have to hit them up and say, hey, you know, they like us better than they like you. No. <laughs> Was that on video? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, no, we do love you guys so much. My husband will be. We will be back next week. Hallelujah. We'll be here. Um, he's going to teach on defining moments, so you don't want to miss it. It's going to be good. I promise you that. He's, he is one of my favorite preachers. <laughs> I like to hear him um, speak, and that's not just because he's my husband. Oh, I'll give you a, um, a little free bit of advice. One of the ladies here asked me last week, she's like, how do you do it? <laughs> how do you do this? So this is for all you women in here. Actually, husbands could probably hear this too. You're not recording anymore, are you? Oh, you are? 
Um, well, she had mentioned to me, well, how do you do it? Because we were talking about, you know, that we travel all the time. And she was like, how do you do it? And how did you know that it was God's will and this, that, and the other, or God's perfect plan and purpose for your life? Well, first of all, uh, it was my choice to get married, right? So I, ch I chose to marry my husband. And so when you choose, my first responsibility is to God. But when you choose to get married, your very next responsibility after God is your spouse, period. So it's my job to serve my husband, and if I feel, and he's the head of the household, so I, I choose to believe that he knows what he's talking about and that he is one with God just as well as I am, and so I serve him with my whole heart. Then comes my children, but my spouse comes first. So listen, listen, even you young ins that are not married, your, your wife <laughs> or your husband, however it may be, whichever role you're in, comes first or second to God, and then your spouse then your children, then the rest of the world. We're kind of unique. I don't need this girlfriend time. I don't know about you ladies, but I'm telling you, I don't need girlfriend time. I need me and husband time. That's the most important time. I don't need to go hang out with my girlfriends to feel all happy and cuddly. And my husband doesn't need to go hang out with all his boyfriends to feel all good. I don't know why I'm saying this. Maybe somebody needed to hear this tonight. But it's, when you're married, it's you and, you and your spouse time. That's the most important time. Not to just go off and go on girl vacations or guy vacations or whatever it may be. I'm telling you, your spouse is your number one, next to the second, I keep saying number one, but God's first, then your spouse, then your children, then the rest of the world. <laughs> so anyway, that was free. No charge. <laughs> no. We love you guys. And uh, don't forget, Sunday, you've got another, um, I don't know, unless someone wants to come up here and talk, you've got another um, pastor coming in to uh, try out. And so I encourage you to be here and to hear him. His name is James Miller. He's actually the godparent to my kids <laughs> because he did an amazing job raising his kids. And so um, he's, he's a great man of God. And so make sure that you are here for that on Sunday. There you go. You're here to finish what he started. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> he did your job.